Good morning. Welcome into Yako Community Church. I want to invite you guys to stand with me this morning. We're going to get started with, a, started with the word of scripture here. It comes out of Psalm chapter 100, verses 1 and 2, and it says this. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. So we're going to do just that this morning. We're going to get started with some worship.
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone messiah still and all So now is the time we're going to send our kids to jam. Uh, you guys can meet Nico in the back. Everyone else, now's the time for fellowship. Refill your coffee, or more importantly, we'll greet somebody next to us, maybe somebody you haven't seen in a while. And yeah, we'll be back here for the message in about five minutes. Good morning. <laughs> okay. So I was asked to make a few announcements this morning. First announcement is for the men's retreat coming up September 24th through the 26th. Um, a lot of you might remember John from the chili cook-off last year. He was going to be our keynote speaker. Um, cost is $85 to attend, and if you're wanting to attend the fishing derby, it's $125. Our wonderful assistant, Carrie, is going to hand out the uh, sign-ups right now if you guys are interested. Um, the 125 is for a fishing derby that we're going to be going on for Saturday, in case any of you are wondering what that's for. Uh, secondly, uh, the coffee ministry is looking for helpers. There are two positions open. 
to set up and four positions open to clean up after the second service. Um, and then I was given this to ask to read. It says, thank you to everyone for praying for our beautiful miracle. Thank you for showering our little family with so much love and blessing. Thank you for all the check-ins, the gifts and delicious food. We appreciate all of your support and it's so incredibly much. Uh, that is from Ryan and Hannah Kalor. How you doing, bud? <laughs> so that was just a thank you from everybody, from them to all of us as a church. So, and with that, I'm going to turn everything over to Dr. Bob. Thank you, Josh. Well, it's good to see all of you on this beautiful summer day. I was commenting with some of the folks earlier today how blessed we are to live in the Northwest, where even the hottest days are not like Arizona, and the uh, wettest days aren't like the monsoons along the Gulf Coast. And this time of year, even in a drought, we get to enjoy the beauty of green and some colors. We're, we're very much blessed, and as we view God's creation about us, we're just reminded that we don't worship the creation, we worship the Creator. And that's why we've gathered this morning. So I would uh, invite you to find your place in the Scriptures this morning in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. That's where we're going to be in a few moments. Jesus' great commission to the apostles and to the church is found in each of the Gospels, but particularly I'm drawn this morning to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, where he told those disciples becoming apostles to go and make disciples of all the nations. He also told them how that was to be done. Jesus said, you make disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So if we are serious about making disciples and being disciples, we need to look and see what Jesus said in the Gospels primarily, but also as his teachings are reflected in other places, to see what he said on a variety of subjects that have to do with our life and our faith. One conclusion that one reaches from examining the Gospels and their teachings about Jesus' life and his ministry is that disciples are praying people. Today we're looking at a passage in which Jesus gave instruction on the subject of prayer. He tells us in the passage that is before us that prayer gives our lives direction. The text of the morning is part of the Sermon on the Mount, which could be understood as the covenant of Jesus' kingdom. It's that where he sets out his priorities, the ethical and spiritual realities and standards that pertain to his rule. And at least twice in this brief discourse, three chapters in our Bibles, he addresses the subject of prayer. The second of those is this morning's text, Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. So will you follow along as I read these verses? Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Jesus on the subject of prayer. The story is told of a Sunday school class of children who were writing a letter to one of the missionaries their church supported. The letter said this, Dear missionaries, we are writing this letter to tell you that we are praying for you. We don't expect an answer. We 
Well, that is a humorous story. Go ahead, feel free to laugh if you find it funny. The humor in it is in its ambiguity. Is the expectation that the missionaries won't answer the letter or that God won't answer the prayer? There's another story that's not quite as ambiguous and is a little more convicting, perhaps. This one is a story of a certain farm community, it was said, who was experiencing a drought. And so a number of the folks in the local church decided to gather in a field owned by one of their church family to pray for rain. In time, a local skeptic happened by, saw the gathering, and stopped to ask what they were doing. Told that they were praying for rain, the skeptic observed, well, that's interesting. You're praying for rain, but I don't see a single umbrella. Ouch. Sometimes our professed expectations of prayer don't match our behavior, do they? And so that's probably why it's a good idea for us from time to time to revisit the subject of prayer and to understand what it is that this is about. There are a lot of variations on how people understand prayer. For some, probably many of them not folks who are, are believers as we would consider ourselves to be, see prayer as a, a desirable form of wishing someone well. Sometimes you'll see it in the media where an interviewer will be talking to somebody who's experienced a tragedy and, and that interviewer might say, well, our prayers are with you. Or you might hear somebody say things like, God bless, or you are in our thoughts and prayers. You appreciate the sentiment of support and sympathy, but you really don't expect that those folks are adding you to a daily prayer list that they bring before the Lord each day. Around here, we have a very different expectation of prayer. Many of you have a personal devotional time with the Lord on a regular basis in which you study and read his word and you pray. We collect prayer requests as a body in the, one of the boxes there in the back or through communication with our church office, and those requests are, are put out to various folks in the congregation for prayer on behalf of those making requests. We have a monthly prayer calendar that guides our prayer through the month day by day so that we can hold before the Lord the concerns of our church and its ministry. We pray in our growth groups, we pray in our shepherding ministries, and we pray in our worship services. Our prayers are not mere pro forma exercises. When we pray for someone, we believe that we are laying claim on the power of God to intervene on their behalf. And our text this morning informs and undergirds that kind of expectation for our prayers. This morning I want to develop our passage around three questions and their respective answers. Question one we find in verse seven, and the question is this, why should we pray? Answer, because Jesus told us to. Look at it in verse seven. Ask, seek, and knock. Those are directive statements. In fact, they might be fine-tuned a little bit to translate this way. Ask or be asking or keep on asking. Seek, be seeking, or keep on seeking. Knock, be knocking, or keep on knocking. So when Jesus tells us to pray, he not only tells us to pray, but he tells us to pray persistently. Three times he says it. Three different pictures there with those three words and three times for emphasis so that we don't miss the point. Now, you might ask, well, why not just pray once and be done with it? You know, a one and done experience. I once knew a man, a very godly man. I had a great deal of respect for him in his walk with the Lord, his love for the Lord. But he was a man who took a different view of prayer than the one that I am speaking this morning. He was of the opinion that you brought a prayer request to the Lord once and left it there. That once was sufficient to, uh, to bring the prayer request and then go on to other things. 
He based that on Jesus' teaching in the first discussion of the subject of prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, which you'll see if you just look across the page in Matthew 6, verse 7. In verse 7 of Matthew 6, we read these words, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. Do not use repetition. And so he said, if you're coming back persistently in prayer, you're repeating yourself. Jesus forbid repetition. He says that's the way the Gentiles pray, and you don't march to their drumbeat. Well, there's another word, there's a key word in that statement of repetition that modifies it, that makes a little bit of difference in this discussion. He says, don't use meaningless repetition like the Gentiles do. Prayer is not an occasion of babbling or, or a mindless repeating of some kind of mantra trying to empty your mind. That's the kind of praying that Jesus is, is uh, rebutting in his uh, rebuke of meaningless repetition. Some translations have it there empty or vain, and that's the idea of those repetitions. Now, what would make their Gentiles' prayers repetitious? Well, read on in verse 7. They suppose that they will be heard for their many words. They suppose. This is their theology of prayer. We've got to keep up these repetitions to be heard. Well, Jesus says in verse 8, just follow along, don't be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. You're, you don't have to to babble on and on so you'll be heard. God hears. In fact, even before you pray, God knows, which might lead us to another question. Well, why pray at all then? If God knows what you ask before you pray, why pray? Just trust God to know and to act. Well, obviously, there's something more to this because Jesus would not contradict himself uh, just a few short verses later. And when we look back at Matthew 6, the passage there, we understand that he's not talking about persistence in prayer uh, as a total picture. The kind of prayer that Jesus is uh, rejecting, as described in Matthew 6, is the sort of thing we see illustrated in 1 Kings chapter 18. That text is probably pretty well known to many of you. It's that passage where Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal along with King Ahab and Queen Jezebel on Mount Carmel. Howard Hendricks called it the battle of the gods. And that's exactly what was taking place there. Ahab and Jezebel had led the kingdom of Israel astray in the worship of a false god, or false gods, really. They had many in their polyistic uh, uh, pantheons. And the people of Israel had largely followed the lead of their king and queen. Elijah was the spokesman for God who repeatedly in his ministry called the people of Israel back to faithful obedience to God. And so the challenge came at Mount Carmel to pray for rain because they were in the midst of a drought. And the challenge was to see which God or God's answers with fire from heaven and subsequently with rain. Now you remember the account. They gathered on Mount Carmel. Elijah alone stood in the name of God. The people of Israel were gathered around to watch Ahab, Jezebel, and a whole entourage of, of uh, false priests were there to pray to their God. Now, they had every advantage. As the, the uh, praying began, they got to go first, the prophets of Baal. And so they prayed literally all day. They prayed from the moment of gathering in the morning until the evening came. About midday, Elijah couldn't resist, and so he began to taunt them a little bit and mock them. Pray a little louder. Maybe your God is deaf. Now, what kind of a God is deaf? They think that they'll be heard for their many words, but the sad reality is they're praying to a God who does not exist, a God who is, in fact, in some sense, deaf. He taunted them in other ways, too. One of my favorites is in the King James translated, perhaps he pursueth. You may not know what pursueth is, but modern translations help you. Perhaps he's gone to the restroom and is indisposed to send fire from heaven at the moment. Well, you know, Elijah just was known to 
say what he meant and mean what he said. Finally, at the end of the day, after the afternoon in which these, pro these prophets prayed the more and the louder, the greater the chaos, trying to get their gods to hear and to answer. They were even cutting themselves, as was their custom, we're told in Kings, as a means to demonstrate their passion and their fervor in their meaningless repetition. Finally, Elijah said, all right, you guys have had your turn. It's over. They piped down, and Elijah stepped up, rebuilt the altar of God, and as we read the account of the preparation, he laid those stones in perfect place. He placed wood on the altar and the sacrificial animal. He dug a trench around the base of the altar, and then he had water brought, and they drenched it. Now, every Boy Scout knows that's not the way you start a fire. You don't drench your wood and everything that you're trying to burn. And then in stark contrast to the, the wild incantations of these prophets of Baal through an entire day, Elijah spoke alone, a prayer that is less than two verses in your Bible, 1 Kings 18, 36, and 37, if you want to read them. He just prayed that very simple prayer, calling upon God to show himself to be the one true and living God in Israel by sending fire from heaven. And you remember the story. In a flash, God sent that strike of lightning. It was so powerful that it burned not only the sacrificial animal, it burned all the wood, it burned the stones, it licked up, licked up the water. That was an answer to prayer unmistakable. But that's the kind of God who answers prayer. Not in response to vain repetitions and babblings, but rather a God who does what he says he will do. So wh why is it then that we should uh, persist in prayer uh, rather than just bring a prayer once and be done? First of all, prayer is not informing an ignorant God. Prayer is not informing an ignorant God. Here's something you'll never hear God say in response to your prayer. Huh, I didn't know Martha was sick. Or prayer is not reminding a forgetful God. Here's another thing you'll never hear God say. I was going to impart some wisdom to Harold regarding that job offer he was considering, but I forgot. Prayer is not informing a forgetful or reminding a forgetful God. Prayer is not nagging to proceed a reluctant God. Something else you'll never hear God say. Virgil's back again, hounding me about reclaiming that wayward child. Why doesn't he give it a rest? You see, those are never things you'll hear God say. Because God invites us to persist in prayer, not because he's ignorant, not because he's forgetful, or not because he has to be nagged into doing something he doesn't want to do. Martin Luther put it well when he said this. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. Rather, it is laying hold of God's willingness. You see, when we pray persistently, we demonstrate our faith and we demonstrate our desire to be involved in God's working in this earth, primarily when he chooses to delay his answers. For sometimes, for reasons that we usually don't understand, God may not choose to answer at the moment of our prayer. He may instead say, wait. God is not always an instant provider like your ATM or your high-speed Internet access or minute rice. Prayer is a means by which we continue to acknowledge our dependence on God and our faith in him to act during a time of waiting for his response. So we pray persistently, confident that, that, that that's what Jesus instructed us to do. But question two then is, why should we pray expecting an answer? Well, that takes us to verse 7 and 8. And the answer is, because God promises to answer our prayers. That's why we pray expecting an answer. It's a response to a promise of God. Look at it again in verses 7 and 8. Ask, 
and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. That's three times, three different ways stated in verse 7, which we were looking at just a moment ago. But now look at verse 8. It corresponds again to those same three directives in the language of promise yet again. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it shall be opened. Three different terms corresponding to one another, six different times, three different ways, six different times. Do you get an impression here? God is making it abundantly clear through these words of Jesus that he promises and he intends to be a prayer answering God. But that raises a problem for us, doesn't it? Or at least a question. Why is it that we don't receive everything we request? Maybe you're not like I am, but I've had to admit and acknowledge that there have been times I've prayed for something that God didn't give me. One thing that comes to mind is my Corvette. Where's my Corvette? I prayed for it. When I was in college, there was a fellow in our dorm, big, tall, lanky Texan, who had a 1964 Corvette. Beautiful car. I mean, the real Corvettes were 63 to 67, fastback. Now, see, you know your Corvettes. I, at the time, was driving a 1966 Rambler Classic. (laughs) Some of you don't know what a Rambler is, but those of you who are laughing do. Let's just say that when you put a Corvette beside a Rambler Classic, one of those cars is a magnet for the girls, and the other one is not. I own the is not. To make matters worse, this tall Texan with his 64 Corvette had his eye on a particular girl in our school. I had my eye on her too. This was going to be an unmatched competition. So why not pray for a level playing field at least? I mean, I can't do much with this torso here, but maybe I could compete at least with a comparable car. So pray for a Corvette. Well, I didn't get a Corvette, but I got the girl (laughs) 50 years ago. Now, when I think about that request, I may have been serious at the time, although I pray that now I would know better than to ask for such a thing. But there are issues that we face in life every day that are are not trivial, like the sort of thing I just mentioned, but are deep issues of human need and suffering. Think about the many requests that we share among ourselves as a congregation as they reflect the burdens that some of us are called to bear from time to time. What about cases of uh, serious illness? Just this past week, we had a request come through from the church office of one of the uh, younger women in our congregation who was hospitalized with COVID. Young mother, husband, two children at home in the hospital with COVID. Those requests are not uncommon. Many times we'll receive requests from folks who have lost a loved one through maybe a tragic accident or through some some fatal disease and illness. There are requests that come often sharing burdens of of, uh, folks who have a concern for a loved one who has strayed from the Lord, who needs to come to faith. Those kinds of requests are deep and profound concerns. And we might say, well, why doesn't God answer those requests if he doesn't? Now, often... We rejoice that he does answer those requests. I'm amazed as I hear your stories about how frequently God answers those kinds of requests. Some of them, uh, you've shared your stories with me. And some of you are in this uh, this body today who uh, uh, an unbeliever might have thought they won't live to be here today. Some of you can tell testimonies and stories of God's working in extraordinary ways in your life relationships in answer to prayer. 
It's the way that God works. But what about those cases when we don't see the answers? Well, we persist in the waiting, of course. But then we also understand that God is not like a genie under some obligation to give us everything we demand. God, is, uh, God does not work that way. Other principles of prayer create a balance by which God functions to answer our prayers in ways that are consistent with the whole, whole totality of his person and his broader purposes in this world and in our lives and in our church. I think, for example, of what we read in 1 John 5, 14 and 15 that says God answers as we pray according to his will. Those verses say this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked of him. In other words, when we pray according to God's will, he takes great pleasure in fulfilling his will in accordance with our requests. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's a convenient way out. Just uh, attribute it to God's will if you don't get what you ask for. And maybe you do so uh, with a, an air of resignation or maybe with a genuine humility. But somehow you think you're getting God off the hook by just saying, well, it was not the will of God to grant that request. Well, if you pray and are disappointed that God does according to his will, will rather than to give you what you ask, my question simply would be, why would you want anything other than God's will? Would that not be the best thing for you to have and to ask God for? What could be better than receiving the perfect will of God? Romans 12, 2 tells us that God's will is good and acceptable and perfect. Friends, you can't improve on good, acceptable, and perfect. It's, it's, a, it's a will that is in alignment with the perfections of his person. We ought to be thankful that God denies some of our requests because his will is far superior to the things that we think are better for us. I don't know about you, but I'd have to confess that sometimes I pray very much like a fool. I ask for dumb things. I ask for things in ignorance. And with hindsight, I'm thankful that God didn't answer my every request. Ruth Graham, the wife of Billy Graham, said that if God had answered her every prayer, she'd have married the wrong man seven times. Sometimes it's a blessing in disguise, perhaps, to us until we come to terms with it. But it's a blessing that God doesn't answer all of our requests. A second balancing principle is found in James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, where we're told that God doesn't answer at times because we ask with impure motives to gratify our lusts, as the King James translates it. New American Standard translates it, uh, our pleasures. This is what James 4 says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So long, Corvette. If the Corvette didn't fall to 1 John 5, I think it probably fell to James 4. But then there's another principle of balance that I think we do well to take into account. This one is shared by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. He speaks very personally of his own experience with unanswered prayer in that passage. He tells us there that God may not grant a request because God's greater glory will be seen in the denial. Here's what he said. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. 
Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. You see, there was a man who understood that the far more important thing is the manifestation of the glory of God in whatever way he sees fit to answer or to demonstrate his glory in the answering of prayers. And to be the vehicle of displaying the glory of God is the highest of privileges that you and I could expect to receive. So with all of these qualifying principles, one might come back to Matthew 7 and say, well, what's the point of praying? Is this kind of like you give something in the main text and then take it away in the fine print? Is that the way this is working? Is this somehow a... uh, an enticing and an alluring promise that really is meaningless at the bottom line? Well, obviously not if we can depend upon Jesus. Jesus' promise is reliable, but we must understand it to be tempered by the notion that his answers will always be consistent with his perfect purposes and his perfect person. And friends, that's a good thing because God is not fickle. Our challenge is to persist in prayer until God either grants the request or in an unmistakable way says no. And in the meantime, while we're in the battle, while we're struggling with the illness, where we're trying to make sense of the broken relationship, whatever it may be, we have the opportunity to examine our motives in prayer, to be sure before God that they are pure, and to seek broader understanding of his purposes as they're being worked out in our lives, in us and through us. The challenge for us is that we often don't persist long enough. The challenge for us is often that we quit too early. I want to share a story with you. And I think that some of you will identify with this story very closely because if you just change the name I'm going to give you, it would fit your story almost to a T. I know that because I've heard your stories. And it's also true for not only the specific situations in the story I'm about to tell, but how many of you, as you have persisted in prayer, have seen God answer, maybe not in a flash or in an instant, But you've seen God answer over time and in his perfect time. I had a student a number of years ago when I was teaching at Western Seminary in Portland, a student by the name of Heather. Heather and her husband had come to faith in Christ in their adult life. They were studying at the seminary, preparing to uh, go as missionaries and as um, church planters among the Mormons. They, because they came to Christ later in life and from non-Christian families, they had a heavy burden for their family members who did not know Christ. In particular, Heather had a favorite aunt who she desperately wanted to see come to know Christ. And so from the time that Heather became a Christian, she began to witness to her aunt. She began to pray for her aunt. And yet, as she would have conversations with her aunt, there was no indication that this aunt had any interest in spiritual things or in coming to faith in Christ. That resistance did not deter Heather. She continued to pray. She continued to witness as she had opportunity. And yet, regularly, she was rebuffed. No answer in sight. For 20 years, that was the pattern. Prayer, witness, no response. Until after 20 years, at the age of 92, Heather's aunt came to faith in Christ. As Heather and I were talking about that, one of the questions that we discussed it between ourselves was why did God not bring her to faith at the first hearing of the gospel 
If she's going to be a Christian, why not be a Christian 20 years earlier and enjoy the, the fruit and the benefit of 20 years of life lived in the faith? Why the delay? Why didn't God answer more quickly? Well, both of us conceded we have no idea. That's one of those things that God did not choose to tell us. But I asked Heather this. I said, Heather, what do you suppose God's done in you during those 20 years of persistent prayer and witness? Now that Heather could answer. And I'm sure that there were plenty of other folks who could give answers to that same question from how God had worked in them through this whole experience and situation. And it's the same thing in your prayer life too. When you persist in prayer as a demonstration of your faith, God is doing a work in you. God may be intending to work in those for whom you're praying, but he's also doing a work in you at the same time in strengthening your faith and strengthening your witness. And though God can act in any number of ways, we might say, well, I wonder what if. I wonder what if things had gone in the way that I prayed initially, what would I have missed? What might not have occurred in my life as well as the lives of others? So we should pray because Jesus told us to, and we should pray expectantly because God has promised to answer our prayers. Finally, we come to question three. Why would God promise to answer our prayers? Why would God make such a promise as this? It's not that he's obligated to. We might even have to concede it's kind of a bothersome thing to him if we were thinking as we think of God. It's a bothersome thing for him to be hounded by some of our requests. Why would he promise to answer our prayers? And we find the answer to that question in verses 9 through 11. And it's this, because God is good. And God is good all the time. Now you look at verses 9 through 11 and you say, now wait a minute. I mean, look at it with me. What man is there among you who when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake. Will he? Obvious answer is no. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Now, there's a lot of talk about giving good things, but that, those verses don't say that God is good. In fact, what they do tell us is that bad people can do good things. So how do we know that this text is teaching us that God makes this promise because he's good? It's rooted in a fundamental attribute of his character. Well, hang on with me, and let's walk through and understand the form of expression that Jesus uses here. The argument that Jesus gives here is uh, a classic form of argument known as argument from lesser to greater. The argument works this way. If you know something about one entity, it's a comparative argument. It's comparing two things. If you know something about one entity and it is by comparison lesser than the other, If something is true of that entity, you are all the more certain that it is true of the greater entity. Now think of it in this example. Suppose it's wintertime. Maybe if you know Minnesota, you'll think about Minnesota. But it's wintertime. It's cold and snowy outside, and there are two cars sitting in your driveway. Husbands, the one is the car you drive. It's an old rust bucket, worn out on its last legs. You hold your breath every time you try to start it, and you're just, well, I'm not going to say you're praying, but you're waiting for the day that it will fail so you can haul it off to the junkyard in good conscience. That's just how lesser that car is. The car sitting next to it, which is the one your wife drives, is brand new, straight off the showroom floor. On this cold, snowy morning, Uh, A thoughtful husband might be concerned. I wonder if my wife's car will start so she can go about her day's business. But you've got to get to work in the old rust bucket, so you figure I better get the old rust bucket started. You climb in, you go through the starting routine, and with a little coaxing, the car starts. And you reason in this fashion. Lesser car. 
started in cold, snowy weather. If the old rust bucket will start in this weather, how much more certain is it that the new car will start? And so with confidence, you just text your wife and say, don't have time to start your car, but trust me, it'll start, and off you go. See, you didn't know, but you used the argument of lesser and greater in going about the business of your day. Well, that's exactly the form that Jesus is using here. Notice what he says in verse 9. What man among you is there? Now, there's one of the compared individuals. He identifies a man who is going to be identified as a human father. There's another father that he's going to speak of, and that's our father in heaven, the God to whom we pray. He says in this ninth verse, What father is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Now, a loaf is bread, and that's a very life-essential substance. You'd think that a very uh, natural response of a father would be to give a, the, the bread that, this, that the child asks for, right? I mean, what kind of father wouldn't? Or, to take it a step further, the child asks for a fish, especially around the Sea of Galilee. That would be very common uh, lunch fare. And so the, uh, the child asks for a fish. What kind of father would give him a snake instead? Now, some people eat snake meat, but I don't want to have anything to do with them. I don't want to eat them. I don't want to touch them. I don't even want to look at them. You see, if, if this father were to give that child a stone or a snake instead of a loaf or a fish and say, here, eat this, you little toad, we would think that's intolerably mocking and cruel, and we would be right. In fact, Jesus asked the question in such a way that he said, of course you wouldn't respond by giving a stone or an, a snake in response to a crest for fish or bread. No decent father would do such a thing. But then he says in verse 11, If you then, you earthly father, being evil... Now, wait a minute. I thought that this father gave bread and fish, not loaves or not stones and snakes. You being evil... Well, let's just admit it. That's the part of fallen human condition. We're evil. Doesn't mean we don't ever do good things, but it does mean that at our hearts, our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And if you wonder if you're corrupt, just ask yourself the question, what do you do when somebody cuts you off in traffic? If you wonder what to do, I can give you some suggestions about how to be not only corrupt, but creatively corrupt when somebody cuts you off in traffic. How many of you may be normally fairly even keel and uh, patient and steadfast, but, you know, sometimes they just push your button? And it's like Vinny the Volcano, an explosion. Even good fathers are still evil and do evil things. But this is where the point of comparison becomes so critical. If evil fathers do good things for their children, read on in verse 11, how much more will your father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? You see, God's granting of our request is grounded in his perfections and goodness. And that sets him apart from the way that human fathers would even do good things. The goodness of God is described by theologians as referring to his kind disposition, his character as being ethically righteous and good. A good passage to read in this connection is found in Exodus chapter 33, verse 19, and then down into chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. You may remember the scene there. Moses is on the mountain, and he's there with God who is putting the commandments on tablets of stone. This would be 
by anybody's definition, the ultimate mountaintop experience, spiritually speaking. And Moses makes a request of God that he might show him his glory, show him his goodness. And God says, you couldn't stand that. You could not take it. But God says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to cover you with my hand there. I'm going to cause my glory to pass before you. And then you may see the backside of my glory. Now, that was enough of an experience that when Moses came down from the mountain, he had a glow on his face such that the Israelites had to place a veil on his face so that they could stand the look. But in chapter 34, when we have the actual passing of God before Moses, his goodness is declared in a number of specific attributes that theologians subsume under the characteristic of his goodness. Here are some of them. Number one, benevolence. Benevolence to all of God's creatures. This embraces what we call common grace. That is the fact, as Jesus said, that when God sends the rain, he sends it on the just and on the unjust. There are people who blaspheme God who refuse the gospel offer of of salvation by faith. There There are those who mock him, who will mock you as his followers. There are those who will defy every one of his moral mandates as their right and privilege. They just are rebels against any authority that God would display. Now, I'll tell you, if if I were in God's shoes, I wouldn't take too kindly to that, and I surely wouldn't be passing out any favors to such people, would you? I mean, are you any different than I am at that point? And yet the Bible tells us that the God who is good, despite the abuse that he might take from people, still sends his reign on the just as well as on the unjust, so that their lives can flourish insofar as they can flourish without Christ in their lives. Of course, you and I know that you don't flourish in the fullest sense unless Christ is in your life and at the center, and you're following him as one of his disciples. But his benevolence is a manifestation of his, of his goodness. If you want a verse, just look back in Matthew chapter 5 at verse 45, and you'll find that reference to God sending the rain on the just and the unjust. Another attribute that is subsumed under God's goodness is his love. And we know that his love is that which prompts him to work in redeeming sinners and granting us salvation. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, gave his son to die in our place, so that if we believe in him, we should not perish, suffer suffer the consequences, the eternal consequences of our sin. We should not perish, but instead receive the gift of everlasting life. That's a demonstration of God's goodness in his love. Not surprisingly, also included in his goodness is his grace, which is undeserved or unmerited favor. Not that we deserved anything that God has done good for us. Not that we have any claim to demand things of him and expect him to jump to. Grace is something that we do not deserve. And yet God, in his infinite goodness, extends it to us anyway. Nowhere is that more evident than in our salvation. As Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. What a wonderful new transformation. What a wonderful new destiny. What a wonderful description of a life that flourishes as a new creation in Christ. Another attribute of God subsumed in his greatness or his goodness is his mercy. Mercy is the disposition of God to look at his creatures in their their suffering and in their their state of, of desperation and to act to bring them relief. We talk about 
mercy, uh, mercy ministry sometimes. It derives from this very concept as we find it in the New Testament. Mercy ministries are those kinds of things such as hospitals and rescue missions and orphanages, those kinds of, of concerns that have often been established and run by Christian people and, and churches in years past and even some to this very day where they see the, the needs of people in a broken and fallen world and they bring their resources together to help and to support. That is a manifestation of the mercy of God in his compassion. I'm reminded of that day that Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus. It was a day in which Jesus put on display his great mercy and compassion. We're told in the shortest verse in the Bible there that Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus because he experienced the loss, the suffering of that loss in death. And he was compassionate and moved for the suffering of his friends Martha and Mary who had lost their brother in death. And Jesus, in his mercy, spoke those words, Lazarus, come forth, raised Lazarus to life, a deed of his mercy. And we're reminded that as a minister of God's mercy, Jesus is our great high priest. We're told that in Hebrews chapter 4 where we are invited to come boldly to the throne of grace to bring our prayers and our requests to, to God in prayer that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. What a sweet pair, grace and mercy. Undeserved as grace, but effectual in bringing us relief in mercy. That we might find mercy to help in time of need. And that is mediated through prayer, as, as the writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 4 of his book. A final characteristic of this goodness of God is his long-suffering. We might understand this as his patience in the way that he works with ongoing disobedience, long-suffering. You know, there's a sense in which the Bible teaches us that God is long-suffering toward sinful rebels who reject him outright. The kinds of people I described earlier who blaspheme, who have no use for God, who want nothing to do with him or his people. And, you know, if I would think of myself in situations like that, I would think, with lightning so cheap, why does God put up with this? And I think if I were God, I wouldn't. And maybe you would be of the same mind as I. But God is a God who is long-suffering. And we ought to be thankful for that because he's not only long-suffering with those who are outside of the faith. He's often long-suffering with us when we find obedience to be a difficulty. God doesn't write us off. When we persist in prayer, often for something that may be um, the fruit of our own disobedience at certain points, God is there to forgive. God is there to restore. God is there to bring us back into fellowship as a manifestation of his goodness and his grace and his mercy. Is it any wonder that a God who is good would promise to answer your prayers and then do as he promised. In conclusion, I want to leave you with three exhortations today. Number one, I want to urge you to pray persistently because Jesus has told us to. So when you find yourself growing weary, don't give up. Continue to pray. Continue to seek the face of the Lord and to, to intercede on behalf of others as well as to pray for yourself, looking for his answers. Secondly, pray expectantly. For Jesus says, God will answer. Bring your umbrella to the prayer meeting. And finally, pray 
gratefully. For we have to do with a God who is a good God. And as a good God, delights to answer our prayers. As the worship team comes, will you join me in prayer? We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for the assurances of your word. Remind us of the God with whom we have to do in all of his perfections, his compassion, his grace, his love, and including all of those things, his infinite goodness. Lord, we thank you that when we pray, we act grounded in your goodness. And we pray expectantly because we know that you have promised to answer prayers and you're a God who keeps your promises. And we would pray that you will strengthen our spirits to persist even when we may grow weary, knowing that it's not over until it's over. And you may be delaying your answers to do a work that is beyond what we could even ask or think. So find us to be a people of prayer, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you guys stand with me for this last song? And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power. Spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus painted home, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. When before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all. A crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my a crimson stain he washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow amen so that concludes our service for today just uh, want a quick reminder want to invite you guys as you head out to uh 
to check in with Teresa in the back. We're looking for coffee ministry volunteers, so check in at that table in the back. Other than that, have a great week, and we'll see you guys again next Sunday.